the select verses in Romans chapter number 1, of verses 21 through 23. We'll begin reading in verse 21. The Bible says this, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. <clears throat> Excuse me. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. I'm sorry, excuse me. And verse 23, one more time. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Continue reading verse number 24 through 25 as well. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 25, I want to focus on. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. <clears throat> then it says this. And worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The title of the sermon this evening is Worshipping the Creature. Worshipping the Creature. Now there is a prevailing philosophy that's being pushed on. The United States of America, Western you know, societies, our civilization, if you will, however you want to term that, even more so than the rest of the world today. This is being propagated by different uh, media outlets, Hollywood, of course, being the tip of the spear of this. But people are trying to get you today to worship and serve the creature. People are trying to get you to glorify the creature. There are many people in the United States of America today that glorify the creature. And the same people that uplift the creation, that uplift the creature, are the same exact group of people <laughs> that defy God, aren't they? The same people that try to teach you that animals are just equal to and the same as man are the same people that hate God. And they hate the God of the Bible. Now, I'm going to show you quickly that there's nothing new under the sun. Here in the United States of America, the far left, if you will, those types of really heavily liberal people, when it comes to morals and things like that, this group of people, when they, they're the ones that really try to propagate and push this type of philosophy. And they try to make you think that this is new, don't they? That this is a progressive type of thinking. That this is, you know, something that is trendy and we are moving forward. They try to say this is advancement in our culture, don't they? They try to act like that this is not the way that people, you know, have thought or a philosophy that people have held in the past. But it's exactly the exact opposite. Though the Bible says, as I, as I quoted just a moment ago, loosely, in Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says there's nothing new under the sun, Right? So I'm going to show you that this type of philosophy, first at the beginning of the sermon, is nothing new. And it's, in fact, it's not something trendy or even civilized. It comes from a very barbaric type of philosophy. So right here in Romans chapter number 1, everyone in here is very familiar with this chapter. This is not a, you know, a group of verses you want to be found anywhere, is it? You do not want to have the list of the attributes or, or be lumped in with these type of people. And where do we find what do we find here when speaking of someone that has been rejected by God, a reprobate, if you will? What do you see emphasized? That these people love the creation, don't they? They love the creature. Not only do they love the creature, they worship and serve the creature. And then it says, look down, let's read it. Worship and serve the creature. It says, more than, more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The types of people that worship and serve the creature today are the same types of people, as I said, that defy God. They hate God. They hate the God of the Bible. They hate the morals of the Bible. I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter number 17. 2 Kings chapter number 17. These types of people, you know, today we have a, 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 a day that may or may not even be considered a national holiday now called Earth Day. Earth Day, where you're just supposed to basically revere and glorify what? The earth. The creation, right? We have, you know, people when they refer to creation, what do they call it oftentimes? Mother nature or mother earth, right? What is the point? They're trying to, they're trying to, you know, turn the, cre the creature into some sort of goddess, aren't they? This is not not anything new, my friend. This is just a repackaged, you know, a uh, uh, type of worship of the creature that the Bible warns you of. And I want to show you that this is actually barbaric. Look at 2 Kings chapter number 17. I want you to look at verse number 
uh, 16. We'll begin right there. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images. Look at this. Even two calves. And made a grove and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. So notice they're, they're, they're worshipping all the hosts of heaven when they make a creature or, or, or a, a molten image. What is it? It's of a preacher, isn't it? Look at verse 17. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. This is the path that someone goes down when they leave the Lord. And that's exactly what's happening in the United States of America today. People are turning their back from God. They're turning their back on the Lord, on the Bible, and they're moving towards this type of worship of the hosts of heaven. Worship of animals, of creation. That's why we have this philosophy that's being pushed on us that animals are all, they're just the same as people, aren't they? I want you to turn over, uh, while you're in 2 Kings, another one that's close by, go to chapter 21. Just to make that easier on us, go to, we'll go here to 2 Kings chapter 21 first. Look at 2 Kings chapter 21, we're going to read a few verses here. Look at verse number 1, speaking of Manasseh. Of course, who ended up being a very wicked man. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Watch this. After the abominations of the what? The heathen. That's like the pagans. The heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. And he reared up, reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did Ahab king of Israel. Watch this. And worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Notice this worship of the creation. This worship of the creature. Notice what's tied in with this again. I want you to keep looking. Verse 4. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. <clears throat> and he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in two courts of the house of the Lord, worshiping the creature. Verse 6. And he made his son pass through the fire and observe times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He goes on in verse number 7 saying he sets up graven images as well. So what do we see repeatedly when we look this up? We see a very barbaric type of behavior, right? We see people acting like animals. Not only that, we see them worshiping the creature, right? We see them worshiping the creation, the host of heaven. They're setting up all these idols, and oftentimes the idols are what? Of the creature. But not only that, you know what you also see these same people doing? Both times they're offering their sons and their children in the fire, aren't they? They're, they're offering child sacrifices. Why? Because they're uplifting the creature. They're uplifting the creation. So you know what their view automatically comes of mankind? Where they belittle the, the, the value of life. Don't they? That is, the, that is the result of worshiping the creation. You uplift the creation, everything else around you, but then mankind, you're worshiping everything but mankind. That's what's going on here as well. What do we see in the United States of America today? They have their own little child sacrifice going on, don't they? And don't tell me it's different. There's nothing new under the sun. They always try to make things sound new and different and better and enhanced. You know, and nobody thinks, you know, when people live, you know, around the time of the, you know, 100s, 200s, right? If we go back 1,800 years, 1,900 years, whatever, you think they thought they were barbaric? No, no one thinks that. You know, the, the, the way that the United States of America, the philosophy that they are pushing on people, it's not an enhancing philosophy. It's not a philosophy when we're being progressive and we're moving forward. We're actually moving backwards. We're actually being barbaric. You know what they're being like? They're being like a bunch of stinking heathens. That's what they're acting like. Right. They're worshiping and serving the creature. You know, they say it in an intelligent way. I don't, I don't care. You can make anything sound good. That's what it really is. They try to package things up and make it sound good. But you know what you're like? You're like all those stinking pagans and heathen that were worshiping the creature. That's what you're like. All those people, you know, thousands of years ago that just lived like an animal, eating their own feces. That's the life that you live. Oh, it's different. You know, we, we don't really sacrifice our children. Oh, really? You just have, you know, these operations set up where just women can just walk in there. How many babies a day are, are being aborted? Does anybody know the modern number right now? Several thousand, yeah. I mean, it's like 30,000 or something a day, isn't it? Is that too high? I think it's like two or three thousand. Two or three thousand, something like Maybe three thousand is what it is. I think there's a three in it. That's probably more accurate. I thought that was high when I said it. But, I mean, goodness sakes, three thousand a day? 
Yo, I mean, yeah. 27,000 really makes a big... I mean, 3,000 kids a day are being killed. Right. They're being aborted. You know why? Because mankind isn't important. What are they doing? They're uplifting the creature. They're uplifting the creation. And then people look down upon the value of, of life of mankind. That's why they try to push this philosophy on you that you came from an animal. Well, then you're no different than them. And you know what? These people today, animals have more rights today than people do. That is a fact, my friend. Go look, go look at some of the laws. Compare the law. That's not, how, that's not a biblical philosophy. And that's why, no wonder, we look around and there's 3,000 children. 3,000 children being aborted a day. What a disgust. How much blood the United States of America has on right. their hands. Right. I mean, that is disgusting. You are no different than these heathens. No, not at all. Right. And that's where it comes from. It, it comes from the belittling of the value of mankind. The belittling of the value of man and of God's, God. The pivotal point of God's creation. That's what we're going to look at right now. I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 1. We need to understand the value of of our lives in the sight of God. We need to understand the way in which we should look at the world. We should look at the animals and the creation that God made. And the way in which we should have our philosophy of this, of this life and of this world. I'm going to read to you again from Deuteronomy 4.15. Along the same lines as what we just read. The heathen worshiping the creature. It says this. Deuteronomy 4, chapter 4, verse 15. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves. For ye saw no manner of similitude on, on the day. That the Lord spake unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven should be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations, under the whole heavens. So we see God warns about the worship or the serving of the creature. I want to look here in Genesis chapter number 1, where I had you turn. We're going to look at the creation of man. We're going to look at the creation of mankind here in Genesis chapter number 1. And specifically, this is the creation of man, of course. We're going to look at... Verse number, or chapter number 1, I want you to look at verse number 26. The Bible's viewpoint on creation and mankind, animals, the values of each. Look at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. <clears throat> so God created man. In his own image, in the image of God, created he him. Male and female created he them. Verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. The first thing that I want to point out is that man, man is created in God's image. Animals are not. There is nothing in creation, there is nothing out there that is said to be created in God's image other than man. So we see that in verse number 26. He makes man in his image. But not only that, immediately thereafter, he tells him, look at uh, 26, it says this, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. Keep reading, and over the cattle and over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So immediately when they're made, when God is made, when man is made by God, He tells them, "Hey, I'm giving you dominion." What does it mean to have dominion? It means that you have rulership over them, right? Like a kingship type of situation where you rule over all the earth. Man is meant to be the boss of all of creation. I want you to think about that. Man, God obviously is the Lord of all. He made it, but then He delegated the authority to mankind and said, "Hey." You're the boss of all of creation. That's what it means to have dominion. What does it mean? To, it means to rule like a king. That means that there's nobody telling you what you can and cannot do, really, is there? You can just do what you want with creation, right? Now, obviously, we're going to get to this in a minute. God has purposes for all of creation for us, for resources and things like that. But first, we see that man is created in God's image, 
And then immediately thereafter, he gives them dominion. And I'm going to read to you from James chapter number 3, verse number 9, which speaks of man being made in God's image again. It says this, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Flip over to Genesis chapter number 9. Genesis chapter number 9, we're going to see this mentioned again in verse number 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God made he man. I want you to notice how the value that God puts on man above all of his creation. You see God emphasizing the importance or the significance of man. I want you also, let's go ahead and turn. I want to go to uh, Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter number 10. We're going to look at verse number 29. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 10, verse number 29. <coughs> Matthew chapter number 10, so uh, verse number 29. This is, these are going to be a couple of passages where right out of Jesus' own mouth, the Lord in flesh, he's teaching, and he actually contrasts the value of man or mankind with all of creation. Look at Matthew chapter number 10, verse number 29. So it says here, Matthew chapter 10, verse number 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a, th a, a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Verse 30, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Verse 31, Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Saying that your value to God is that of numerous sparrows. That we are worth more to God than many or numerous sparrows. I mean, this right here should just end the argument of, of the value of mankind and the rest of creation. This should really be the end of the argument. Go to Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 11. Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 11. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Obviously, uh, you know what he is referring to. He's being rhetorical when he says in verse twelve, "How much then is a man better than a sheep?" He's, he's teaching you by the question, of course, that man is so much greater than a sheep. He's that much better than a sheep. That if you're going to do that for a sheep, how much better is man? So much better. Where you should risk your life to save a man's life, right? He's that much more worth than a sheep. He has that much more worth than a sheep. Go to Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 26. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 26. <clears throat> Can somebody turn the... Am I the only one that's burning up right now? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. You're hot? No, okay. I am? Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. It's a democracy here. <laughs> Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 26. <clears throat> I'm just a loving shepherd is what that is. <laughs> Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 26. It says this, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. And then he says this, are ye not much better than they? So first we saw him just saying sparrows in general, right? Now, then we saw him speaking of sheep, and now we see fowls specifically. Because man, it, he's using all these different animals to make sure that you, he gets the point across. Man is worth more than animals. That's why God refers to a group of animals as beasts. That's what they are. They're animals. We need to have the philosophy that God has. We need to have, when we look around at mankind, we need to realize that we are of much more value than animals. Amen. When you read in Genesis chapter number 1, it's very clear that the climax of the creation takes place in Genesis 1, 26-28. You can see that it's all building up to making man in his image, isn't it? This is the purpose of his creation, so they can receive glory through Man, it's the purpose of his creation. They have much more value. I want to look at a couple more. Matthew 15, verse 26. Matthew chapter number 15, verse 26. We're kind of bouncing around the book of Matthew. I'm trying to make it easy 
for you to turn to all of these. Matthew chapter number 15, verse number 26, he says this. <clears throat> Jesus speaking, obviously in a parable, I'm not going to explain the context. We can still get the truth that is needed for the, the so scope of the sermon tonight. It says this, verse 26, but he answered and said, it is not meat or not fit, saying it's not appropriate. It is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. What is he saying? It's not appropriate to take a man's food and then just take it and cast it to a dog. Why? Because man is of more value. That's why. He is the one that should have the food before an animal should have the food. That's the whole point. So we see repeatedly. Let's look at an Old Testament passage. Actually, you don't need to turn there. I have you turn. Go back to Genesis, though. Genesis chapter number 1. I'm going to read to you from Leviticus chapter number 24, verse number 21. I just noticed this recently in my Bible reading. It says in Leviticus chapter number 24, verse number 21, <clears throat> And he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. So if you kill a beast you got to, of another man, you need to give that man his beast back. Just restore him another beast. Not a big deal, right? Listen to this. And he that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. Notice the difference in the punishment. You know why? Because the beast can just be replaced. Because the beast just dies and he's gone. But man has value. One person's, one man's life is of, you know, you can't even really compare it unto the creation's value. That's why Jesus said it's of many sparrows, right? It, it's much more of value than animals. So here, when a man kills a beast, just get him another beast. Not that big of a deal, right? Doesn't really matter that much. But if you kill a man, your life's going to be taken. You know why? Because man, like we saw in Genesis 9, is made in the image of God. So go back, like I said, to Genesis chapter number 1. I, I, I mentioned this a little uh, prematurely already, but we saw that man was created in God's image. We see the climax of the creation takes place. The significance of all of creation is man being created. But then after that, what does he do? He, he gives dominion, or he gives the power of rulership over all of creation to man. Let's look at that one more time. Look at verse number 26. Again, so it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle. Look at this. And over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Look at verse 28 again. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. And he says, And replenish the earth. And he says, And subdue it. What does it mean to subdue something? It means to put something like into subjection, where you're ruling it, and subdue it. And it says, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God's stressing that you are the boss, you are the Lord, if you will, over all of creation. He makes, he makes all of creation, and he makes man and says, hey... You rule over all of this. You're the boss over all of this. You subdue it. You have dominion over it. He provides all of creation for man's resources. That's why. That's the whole purpose of all of creation. Obviously, all of cre creation can give glory to God through what, though? Through man viewing it and seeing how great that it is, number one. Number two, uh, glory to God is given through man's life, through man living and, and the things that we, you know, need as far as our necessities come from creation, don't they? All of our resources as far as our lodging, what do we do? To go out, we have to, you know, take whatever, a, a tree, cut a tree down and build a house, don't we? We have to go out if we want to we wanna survive, we have to eat, don't we? So what do we do? We go out, we have to kill an animal, bring it in and eat, right? This is the purpose of creation. Now... Obviously, creation, everything in creation has symbiotic relationships, and they rely upon each other. One thing, and it, and it works kind of like, you know, uh, uh, you can say, you know, eat different things are dependent upon the others, right? But here's the thing. All of it is meant really to sustain man. That's the purpose of it. It's really meant so that man can use creation. He makes man, and he tells him, hey, you have dominion over all of this. That's the purpose of it. He makes everything, and then he ends with creating man. And he says, hey, use this and what, this is what he's saying. Think about this. Use this in whatever way that you need to. That's the entire purpose of all of creation. If, if people were to have that philosophy today, wouldn't that just, like, change a lot of people's way in which they live their lives? I mean, that's really the point. Now, obviously, should we go around just abusing things, tearing things down for no... I mean, it's pointless, right? That's pointless, but use it as needed. I'm going to 
going to show you that here in a couple of different ways, a couple of different verses. First, go to Psalm 8, where we see this somewhat repeated. Go to Psalm chapter number 8. Psalm chapter number 8. Psalm chapter number 8, verse number 4, it says this, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou, made it, for thou made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor, and madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Now notice what it said. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Everything in creation has been put under our feet. Now, of course, there's a double application of this of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, of course, it's, it's referencing back to creation when man was made. Verse 7, all sheep and oxen, yea, and, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. This is David writing. Do you know the way in which he looked at creation? Everything was made for man. You made and created all of the world, all of creation, the beasts of, of the earth, the creeping things, the fish that pass through the sea, everything. And you made them, you know, the works of your hands were made for man to rule over. That's the purpose of everything in the earth. I want you to go, to, uh, go back to Genesis chapter number 9 now. Genesis chapter number 9. One of the reasons why... Uh, uh, things, uh, the things that were created. One of the reasons why animals were made, of course, are for food. The most obvious reason are for food, of course. Look at Genesis chapter number 9, verse number 2. It says this, <coughs> And the fear of you, speaking to Noah and his sons, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. He says, Into your hand are they Delivered. You know what he's saying? You can eat anything that you need. What are you saying? You can go and kill any animal that you desire, any animal that you want. There's nothing off limits, right? I mean, there's all these laws today where people are like, oh, you can't kill this animal, you can't kill that animal. That's not according to the Bible, is it? Not at all. God is stressing and saying, whatever animal you want to go kill and eat at this point, of course, go get them, go kill them. In your hand, they're delivered. He's saying, I've given you, is what he's saying. I've given you everything, right? In the New Testament, we have... 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 4, it says, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be, re be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Of course, in context, it's teaching that you can eat the things of the Old Testament, but it's still the same truth applies. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. He's saying you can eat anything that you want, that he's provided these things for you. Go to, uh, I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 20. Deuteronomy chapter number 20. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter number 20. Now, in Hollywood today, and in the movie industry, the film industry, they put out movies all the time, especially cartoons. And really, Disney is really just, just at, at the top of this, aren't they? They put out cartoons where they depict an animal with you know, the, 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 like the rudimentary characteristics of a human. Just all the basic characteristics that a man has, don't they? And what's the reason why they do that? Well, they create a plot line, don't they? And then always in every one of these movies, something very sad happens to one of the animals, doesn't it? Every one of them. Think about it. And you know what you find yourself doing when you watch these movies? You find yourself feeling sorry for this animal in the same way in which you would feel emotions for what? For a human being. Do you think that's a coincidence? They make you, they, they manipulate your mind to make you think that this animal is like a human being. That's the whole purpose of the movie. And they do this repeatedly. Disney started this years ago in the early 1900s, 1930s or so probably. Now, maybe not, I know some came out like uh, 1910s. I don't know when they started doing it with the animals. But it's just like almost every movie, at least when I was a kid that came out, had to do with animals, didn't it? Where animals are like people. They give them the characteristics of people. They walk around like people. They live their lives like people. Is that a biblical perception? It's not at all. And you know why we have all these, these, these people that walk around today that look at the value of animals as the same as they look at human beings? You may be oblivious to this, my friend, but it's because of brainwashing and manipulating that goes on. There is a real
real movement and a real agenda today, and there's all this propaganda, and they have activists that are trying to get you to belittle the value of human life and to upraise or glorify the value of an animal, of a beast, where a woman will fall in love with an animal. Beauty and the Beast. It's disgusting. Right. It's weird. It's, it's freakish. It's disgusting. Amen. You have all these movies where, you know, like Fox and the Hound. And what do they do? They make the man the bad guy who's out there hunting the animal. That's what God said we should do. Right. That's what God said he put those animals here for. That is the whole reason why creation was made was, hey, I've delivered this into your hands. I have made this and given this to you. You are the boss of it. You are the ruler over it. You do what you need to do with this. And you make people, they try to make you feel bad about hunting the animals in which God created to be hunted. That is an unbiblical philosophy. Amen. That is a philosophy that comes from people that hate God. That's why they believe this way. They don't want you to believe the Bible. They don't want you to see the world in the way in which you should. That animals are animals. They're beasts. They are not on the same level of mankind. Amen. My child is far greater than some stinking dog or some stinking bird. Some right. animal out there. It's disgusting and it's weird. Right. And that's what they're trying to do. And they create this plot line. And, at, at the, and you know, halfway through the movie, you find yourself be, becoming emotionally attached with an animal. What do you see people doing today? You think in the 20s and the 10s that people referred to their dogs and their cats as their children? They would have thought you were out of your stinking mind. They would have thought you were some weirdo and some freak. You know what? You are. That's right. You know, maybe you're confused with this, but that's weird. And that's freaky, and it is not a child. My child is far greater than any animal, some beast, four legged beast. That's ridiculous. And it's weird. And Amen. we need to kind of renew our minds every once in a while and just hear preaching like this and realize that is freaky. Mm -hmm. Look at Romans chapter number 1. It's the same thing people are doing today. And you wonder why all these children are being slaughtered every day because people have grown up and they're trying to make you feel guilty about being a person and a regular man that God created you to be, to use the resources in this world. They try to make you feel bad about it, don't they? All these environmentalist movements and stuff, they want to make you feel bad about all these things. God told me to do that. That's what the Bible commands mankind to do. And whether you're stupid and you're ignorant of why you were created and why this world is here, that's not my problem. Amen. They turn these people into a bunch of weirdos. That's why we have all these stinking 20 to 30 year old millennial freaks walking around looking like a stinking animal. That's why, because they think there's no difference in them and the other. That's why evolution is being taught. It's all the same thing. Nothing's new under the sun. Nothing is new under the sun. What is the whole end goal? Worship. Satan is trying to get them to worship this earth so that he can, in any way that he can, he just wants to deflect worship from God. That's all that it is. It's whatever obstacle that he can put in front of you to stop you from worshiping God and get you to worship anything else. And if it's the creation, well, he's fine with that. As long as you're not worshiping God. Because he's trying to push everything to where he can ultimately receive the worship. Where he ultimately gets the worship. It's weird. This is not normal. Don't, do not let your children watch that weird crap. Where, don't let your kids watch shows where animals are talking and stuff like that. It's weird. They start thinking that they're human beings. They start feeling sorry for them. You know what they do? Then they start thinking that, that life is really like that. Feeling sorry for frogs and stuff like that. It's weird. Right care about a frog. Yeah. I don't give a crap about some toad or something. It doesn't matter. Right. God created me to rule over that thing. I'm not going to walk around and just start killing frogs. But here's the thing. If I want to kill a frog, I'll kill a frog. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Does it really matter? God made it and said, have dominion over it. Rule over it. You know, be the boss of it. Use it. I want you to look at this verse right here. It's super interesting. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 20, verse number 19. When thou shalt besiege a city a long time in making war against it to take it, thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them. It's like, oh man, God really cares about the environment. Okay, let's see about that. <clears throat> for thou mayest eat of them, and thou shalt not cut them down, for the tree of the field is man's life. And then he says, this is obviously to the statement before the parentheses, to employ them in the siege. You know the only reason why he said don't cut those trees down? 
because you can eat of them. You know why I made them? Not, God's not worried about the stinking trees. He doesn't care about the trees, just the, the, the life of the trees. We need to make sure we keep all the trees healthy and intact. No, he made them. The whole purpose and goal of the tree, why they're supposed to be there, is just to give you food, friend. That's all that it is. All of creation was, was created and then handed to man. All of it. Think about that. All of it. All of it was just made. He makes all of creation. And then he makes man. He said, hey, I made all this for you. Here. So all, all of it. Spike says it's delivered into your hands. You're now the boss of it, aren't you? Why? And then we look around. <clears throat> what do we do? You know, we take dominion of things. We, we need a horse. You need to go somewhere. Get a horse and ride it. You're the boss of that thing, right? You need, you need uh, to plow a field. Well, hey, you know, take this cow, take this mule, even more so, and plow the field with this mule, right? You need to find out what, I gave you all of this just so that you can sustain life, so that you can have dominion over all of this. In any way in which it helps you, that's why it's there. Notice he says, don't cut down those trees. You know why? Because the tree I made for you to eat, it doesn't make sense for you just to cut it down. You know, this does, you say, well, you know, as far as like uh, abusing, just going around and just cutting trees down for the sake of it. Just, hey, I just feel like hacking a tree down. Well, God told them, hey, don't cut that tree down because there's fruit on it. If you're not going to use it, it's, it's pointless, right? If you're not going to use it, <clears throat> there's no reason to do it. If it can be used for something else, let me say that. If it has a purpose that, can, that man can use it, and you just... You know, basically just, you know, whatever, just kill, you know, uh, basically chop down a tree and just let all the fruit die. Well, God said, don't do that. God said, you shouldn't do that because I made it for man's life, to, to, to sustain man's life. So we see God's attitude when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, the, the trees here and the fruit that is on them. I want you to go to Mark chapter number five. We're going to look more specifically now at God's treatment of animals. God's treatment, we can, we, can, uh, we can develop more of a worldview on the way in which God looks at the world. <clears throat> what greater place to go for trying to determine how to view the world than from the creator, the whole person that made it? When someone makes something, they make it why? For a purpose. So let's look at the creator's view, right, of the world, the way in which he treated it. Uh, the world, or animals in particular. Here we're going to look at Mark 5. I'm sure you guys have think, seen this before, but this is known, this chapter is known as the mani maniac of Gadara. It's the man that is possessed by a devil. Jesus gets off a ship, and there's a man there that tells you that's crying, and he's screaming out, and he's cutting himself with rocks, and he, he's possessed by a devil. When Jesus comes, the guy bows down and worships him, the Son of God, you know, you come here to torment me before the time, and then Jesus then starts uh, speaking with him, and you know he says he, his name is Legion because he has many devils in him. But I want you to pick up now verse 11. It says this. Now there was there nigh. <coughs> Flip verse 10 first because this is where he requests to be cast out. He besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Talk about the devils. Verse 11. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. Verse 13, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, saying they could leave. Right? It's like a military term. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And then it says this, And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Now, Jesus, when he walked this earth, there were certain things that he did not know. But the majority, when he's walking around, the Bible's telling you all the time that he knows what people are saying in their mind. He knows what's going to happen. The, the, the Bible really only mentions a couple of things that he doesn't know. The vast majority of things, <clears throat> it's hard to understand, you know, how, uh, you know, and, and, and to what extent or degree he was limited, right, in his, in his deity, because he took upon him the flesh, but I would say that he was pretty positive, that he knew, I'm pretty, I feel pretty positive that he knew what was going to be the outcome here. Because what were those devils trying to do when they were in the man? He knows Satan, and what does Satan always try to do? Destruct, exactly, destroy. I mean, that's his goal, is just to tear things down. He is the opposer, right? He is against, he's just trying to destroy things. 
And Jesus, knowing, you know, knowing what's happening, what people are thinking, what does he do here? He allows them, yeah, hey, go ahead and go into the swine. And then what does it say? There in parentheses, the end of verse 13. They were about 2,000. 2,000 pigs or 2,000 swine. Run, it says run violently. And they fall in the water and they're choked in the water. I mean, that is not a pretty picture. I mean, they're falling and probably hitting rocks and busting their head. Blood's everywhere. I didn't mean to paint it more thoroughly for you. But then they fall into the water and these pigs, you think these, these pigs are swimming? Not happening with those little short legs. They're not going anywhere, right? They're, that's why they choke. And, they, you know, and, the, and the, the center of, uh, of mass is like all there in the middle. They're just like basically like tying a rock to them and throwing them in there. And they all just go down and they just choke. They just drown in the sea. You know why? Do you know why Jesus did that? Well, look at what he's worried about. Look at verse 15. And they, it says, uh, these are the men that lead the country. It says in verse 14. Verse 15. And they come to Jesus, and it says this, and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. That's why Jesus did that. You know why? Because man is of much more value than animals. Man is of much more value than sparrows. Man is of much more value than swine or than any other creature that is on this earth. That's the, that is the, the view that God has of this earth. That's the reason why God created man, was to rule over creation. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. First Corinthians chapter number nine. <clears throat> we'll begin reading in verse number eight. Again, we're not going to get the context of this. Just there's a there's a an isolated truth that we can purge from a couple of verses. It's talking about uh, uh, workers of the church being paid. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter number nine. Look at verse number eight. It says this: Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? saying that man should be paid for the work that he does. Verse 9, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth <coughs> of the ox that treadeth out the corn. And then he asks the question, Doth God take care for oxen? So a muzzle is something you put over the mouth of an animal. Now sometimes dogs will be muzzled if they have problems biting, or maybe if a dog... Uh, you know, is going somewhere in a public place and they're not taken in public places often, they'll take a muzzle, won't they? And they'll put a muzzle on that dog's face just in case. They're not sure. He might bite, so they'll put a muzzle on him. Well, sometimes people would muzzle the mouth of the animal that treads out the corn. The animal, the cow or the ox or, or maybe a mule or whatever, they'll muzzle his mouth so that he's not eating the fruit of what you're getting. The whole purpose they have in treading out the corn here is he's... He's going through there and they're picking up at all of the, you know, all of the, the produce, right? They're going in and they're reaping the harvest. And they're saying not to not to muzzle his, his mouth, implying that he should be able to eat those things, right? So this is written in the law, and a person maybe that's reading this in the Old Testament think, well, God cares for that ox. God wants that ox to be able to eat. That ox deserves to eat. Well, look at the next verse. So the last, let me read the last statement of the last verse. Verse: Does God take care for oxen? Here we have our answer, verse 10. Or saith he it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt this is written. That he that ploweth, talking about a man, he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. The word you really need to focus on there is all together. You know what that means? Completely. And in every way. Saying the only reason why God said that, the only reason, that's the point, is because for our sakes. Saying this, let me interpret, he doesn't care for oxen at all. That's what he's saying. Does God take care for oxen or say if he it all together for our sake? All together for our sakes, no doubt. He said this is written or this is said. Saying he doesn't have any care. None. Period. All together. The only thing that he wrote this for wasn't at all for the ox. Think about that for a minute. He doesn't care whether the ox eats or not. That's what he's saying. That's the whole purpose. Now, should you feed your ox? Well, it would be smart of you if you did. Because he's doing the work for you. Right? So that you keep him in good shape. 
so that he's able. That's really, really what you need to worry about is, is he able to provide, you know, uh, proficiently what I need him to do in this shape. So you need to make sure that he's in good enough shape. I mean, that's just basic, right? Basic uh, logic. Go to, we're going to look at a couple of differences here at the end of man and creation. All of creation, the beasts of the earth. Go to Job chapter number 35. Job chapter number 35. Job chapter number 35, right before the book of Psalms. Job chapter number 35. <clears throat> Beasts do not have the understanding or the wisdom that mankind has. God did not create, create them to, to, to have that capacity. Look at verse number 10. Chapter number 35, verse number 10, it says this, But none saith, Where is God my maker? Who giveth songs in the night? Who teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth and make us up, maketh us wiser than the fowls of heaven. Notice how we're wiser. God teaches us more. We have more wisdom, more knowledge, more understanding than the beasts of the earth. Go to Psalm chapter number 73, verse number 22. Psalm chapter number 73, verse number 22. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 73, verse number 22, it says this. So foolish was I and ignorant. And then he says this. I was as a beast. Before thee. What's he, what's he saying? He's exaggerating to emphasize how, how stupid he was when he made a decision. Because why? Because beasts are dumb. They're stupid. They're not smart animals. They're not created to have the capacity of human beings. Intelligent. They're not self-aware. They don't know anything about themselves, do they? They're not aware of, they're not, they're not aware of their own existence. Animals are not aware of, of their own being. Look at, uh, Look at Psalm chapter number 32 while we're in the book of Psalms. Now, you, you may say, well, all of this is, is obvious, right? <clears throat> all of these things I just know very well. Look at Psalm chapter number 32, verse number 9. <laughs> Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth, whose mouth must be held in with, with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Saying they're so stupid that they'll try to bite you or things like that. They're just dumb animals. They're unpredictable. People try to tame animals. What was the guy that had the lion, Roy, and what was their names? Everybody know what I'm talking about? They're very famous. They had the, the, the shows in Las Vegas. They're extremely famous if you look them up. I see people. You, you know what I'm Sick talking about? Roy. Who is it? Siegfried and Roy. Siegfried and Roy, right. They had these animals, and they were so comfortable and familiar with their animals, they let the animals like sleep in their house and stuff like that at night. If you look, I watched a documentary on it where the lion would come in and sleep in his house. They had a couple of animals that they had. They would sleep out. One day when they were on stage, this is an animal they love. I'm sure you asked them. They'd said he never would bite. It's like you walk in people's houses all the time. My dog doesn't bite. Whatever, right? Yeah, I never bite him. Never will bite, right? And then he just like, I don't remember exact, you know, the severity of the of the injury. He didn't die, did he? You know, possibly, but I don't think so. I mean, it was severe. He was injured very badly. The, the lion just grabs him, him and rips him apart. You know, we need to realize that these animals are stupid. Don't let your dog, your, your, you know, if you have some dog that can, like, harm your child, don't let that dog around your kid. Any kind of dog. It doesn't matter whether it's not, like, some pit bull or stuff. Animal, they're animals. They're unpredictable. Some lady in, like, Louisiana, you know, I remember watching this thing with this lady in Louisiana. I don't know how she got a hold of this, but she got a, she got a panther, you know, a black panther. And she lives in a trailer park somewhere in Louisiana. And she, she, she first, like, had it just in her backyard. It was, a, it was like, a, you know, it was a kitten at that time. I guess she would still refer to it as a kitten. And it was growing and getting bigger. Well, she realized, you know, she had to, you know, encase this thing some way. She had to encage this thing some way. So she builds, like, this whole cage for this animal. Well, she's going over to it, and she's feeding, just throwing the meat in, opening the door real discreetly, right? Just throwing the meat in. Well, one day she throws the meat in, and it gets stuck on something. And the animal wouldn't go get it. Because it's stupid. Because they have to have it a certain way, right? They didn't realize, oh, I can go around there, whatever. So she goes in and gets it and, like, brings it to the animal. She's like, oh, I'm all right. Not a big deal. Well, she started doing that every day. Every day going in and petting and playing with the animal. Well, one day, she's real comfortable. She's complacent. Opens the door. Walks in. And the animal is over behind her. Pounces on top of her. Bites her on the top of the head. And, like, sinks its, you know, teeth into her head. is just sitting there. For like hours, two, three hours before somebody heard her screaming. The cops come. The cops, you know, are standing there. They're pointing their gun. They're telling, you know, talking to the lady. Are you all right? You know, she, yeah, she's saying at this point, get him off me. Shoot him, whatever. 
He ends up shooting the panther. This is horrible. They get the, the animal off. The cop said when she stood up that he had ripped the skin off of her skull or her, pet, her hair. When she stood up, it flipped back and it was like sitting on top of her head like that. And he just saw her bare cranium, like her skull on top of her head. You know, so she fixed her head. They took her to the hospital, the ambulance. On the way there, they, because because they, the guy was there. Like it was, they dealt with it like a hostage situation, basically for like an hour or something before he actually shot the panther because he wanted to be careful, I guess, that he didn't want to shoot. So they brought someone from animal control, and and the lady happened to be have her doctorate in like psychology, and that's what she dealt with was was people, you know, having you know emotional issues and things like that with animals. She had her doctorate in that subject. Well, she's talking to the woman. The woman's totally, she, she's, you know, she had a moment of, of, of where she's in reality, right? A moment of realization is what I meant to say. Where she realizes that was an animal. She said to the woman, she said, I knew I shouldn't have been going in there. She kept saying that. I knew I shouldn't have been going in there. It was, I know that that's a wild animal. That lady was in the hospital, was repaired, and she's all fixed back up, and she left. You know what? That same woman met with her and talked to her about all that, and you know what she said to her? She's like, he didn't really mean to do that. People get this brainwashing. Really? That's how strong that it is. To where they look at animals like they can have a relationship with that animal like they can a human being. It's a dumb animal. It has no understanding. Right. It's a foolish animal. You know why they put bits and bridles in the mouths of these animals? Because they don't want them getting near them. Look at what it said right there. <clears throat> very last passage, or the very last uh, clause in that verse, 9. Lest they come near unto thee. You know why? Because they'll hurt you or they'll, they'll, they'll bite you. You need, so you need to watch your kids, especially around dogs. I went, I, when I got, I've been bit a couple of times by dogs going into people's houses. And one, in both times, one of the times the lady was like adamant that the dog would not bite me. I mean adamant. Because the dog, I said it like six times because I could see the dog was kind of acting funny. And I would go in houses and, and when you go in houses all day, you start to realize it's like everybody's got a stinking dog. So, you know, I, I can realize when dogs are acting funny and when they're not. And I'm like, hey, you know, he's acting kind of weird. He's, you know, are you sure he doesn't bite? Said, no, he never will bite. He never will bite. I'm walking down the steps, and the dog, like, you know, I, I took like three or four steps down the stairs, steps down the stairs, and the dog just like, you remember that? Grabbed a hold of the top of my thigh. Oh, I smacked that thing. You have no idea, you know, what, you, your dog is unpredictable. These people take their babies, they leave them in a room with like some vicious animal, like a pit bull or something. Some Rottweiler. You know? There are, here, it is a fact that some dogs are more vicious than others. It would be stupid to try to argue that point. There are some dogs that are just far more vicious than others. You know, this is just the truth of the Bible, my friend. You know, you may feel, you may become loving with the animal. I don't think that's biblical. We put bits and bridles in, in their mouth lest they come near unto thee. You need to beware because it's unpredictable. It's an animal. That animal could love you and treat you well all of your life. Treat you well, treat your children well all of your life. One of your grandkids come over, maybe a young two or three year old, some, I don't know what, pit bull, rottweiler, some big dog, tear that kid apart. Kids die all the time. Yeah, a lot of times it's because people don't train their animals well, but you know what else it is? They're dumb. They have no understanding. They're not a human being. We put bits and bridles in their mouth lest they come near unto thee. You need to be careful. That it, it comes from people thinking that the animal is a part of the family. It comes from this attitude of thinking the animal is just like you. No, it's not. It's not created to be like you. It does not have the understanding that you have. It does not have a value of, of human life like you have. You're just, you know, it's just a stupid animal. It doesn't discern one thing from another. It just knows, it thinks like a baby in concrete thoughts. You know what babies think? I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm tired. Those are called concrete thoughts in philosophy. That's how babies think, that's how animals think. They have such limited ability of emotions, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Be careful with your children about, around animals. That's an important point to walk away from, really. You know, Brother Ellie, you've been bit by dogs or anything? You've been in house, people's houses? Brother Rick? Yeah. What do they tell you? Do they, do they say it to you? 
They did. Brother Rick was bit by a dog, and what do they say? He doesn't bite. He don't bite. He doesn't bite. I have heard that so many stinking times. Some guy, all right, this is the last story. Some guy that I, that I worked at right when I started cabling, I was 19. There was this, uh, this Hispanic guy who was from Columbus, Ohio, and he was working in Cincinnati, Ohio with us at the time, the Cincinnati branch. He was telling me a story when he was in Columbus where he goes in to, uh, he goes in to, to the fence and he's going back and forth and there was two dogs. There was like a little small dog, like, I don't know, like a chihuahua or something, a really small dog. I remember he emphasized the small dog. And then there was a big dog, whatever, Rottweiler, whatever, dogs that are known for like biting people, right? There was a big dog, okay, and a small dog. The small dog, you know, just kept barking, just following around, because they're normally the more loud mouth, right? Just following around, just barking. He's going in and out of the fence. As you're doing that kind of work, you're going back and forth and back and forth. He's walking past the dogs multiple times. And then all of a sudden, one of the dogs turns around, the big dog, I mean. The, the, the small dog kind of like came more at him this time. And the big dog turns around and just like, I don't remember, bites him somewhere like bad. He pulled out a keyhole saw. Does anybody know what a keyhole saw is? It's a drywall saw. You, where you, I probably told people this story. You heard this story before, anybody? He pulled that keyhole saw out, stabbed that stinking dog right in the neck, and like basically ended up having to saw the dog's head off because the dog wouldn't let go of his leg. He said he cut a hole like four inches in the, in the dog's neck because he's just like ripping. A keyhole saw is nasty. It's like jagged. You know what I mean? It's not something, it's not a clean cut. That's my point. Because the dog was like, wouldn't let go. He stabbed the dog in the neck and it didn't let go. And it's long. I mean, it's like, it can be, they can be like eight, ten inches long. So that thing probably went all the way through his neck. And the dog's just holding on to his leg. So he's ripping that thing back and forth, I'm sure, in a panic. And it just kept biting. Or kept, kept holding on to him. I don't know if it's biting like that, but it's, it's biting down. He, you know what he told me that lady said? He was in like a ghetto area. And she's like, it wouldn't hurt a fly. He said he kept saying because the dog was scary. And, it, and the lady's like, no, nah, he won't bite. He wouldn't hurt a fly. I've heard that so many times, man. Yeah, you know, they haven't bit yet. You need to be careful with animals. You need to be careful with animals around. And don't look at an animal like you look at a human being. You're far greater than a human being. Your kid children are far greater than... And uh, you're far greater than an animal. I said you're far greater than a human being. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> you knew what I was saying. That happens sometimes when you hear you know, what I meant to say. <laughs> I don't know what you are if you're better than a human being. I'm a son of God. Amen. Right? Hey, we are far greater than animals. Far greater. God created us and he made us. And what does he say? He stops. He slows down. He stops the story of creation and says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And God made man in his own image. Right? He says, hey, all of this is delivered into your hands. You do with it what you need. It's all for you. See the importance of man. Go to Isaiah chapter number 31. Isaiah, actually just turn to Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. People ask the question, well, do, do animals go to heaven? All dogs do not go to heaven. Dogs don't go to heaven at all. Animals do not go to heaven. Animals do not have the mental capability to understand morals, right and wrong. They do not have self-awareness. They do not realize that they even exist in life and reality and things like that. Their consciousness is not anything on the level of a human being at all. They don't understand right and wrong. Therefore, they do not understand they're a sinner. Therefore, they do not understand that they need a savior. It's ridiculous. It's foolish. My dad... Before I took over a, 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 a boy's home, my dad went there for like four or five years, maybe even longer than that, for, uh, you know, at least five years. <clears throat> he said he was preaching the gospel, and uh, one of the kids started asking questions about animals going to heaven. And uh, my dad was like, no, animals don't go to heaven. You know, the Bible, you know, and I don't know what verses he used. He explained it to him, and, but he, he made the point, though, they can't understand the gospel. And the kid said this. Well, what if I go home? It's ridiculous. But he said, well, what if I go home and I just take a lot of time and I try to explain it to them? I mean, how foolish is that? But it shows what these kids are being taught. It, you, know, you know that emotional connection that he had with his child, or that with his dog, that child had with a dog that no human being should have, where he's so concerned about his dog. 
It's like it's just a beast, man. Right. Especially if you look at what dogs, how dogs are portrayed in the Bible. They're like the lowest of all animals. They really are. All, if someone, if there's go, you know what the worst stinking, uh, you know, slur that you could say to somebody? It's like when you're growing up, like, you know, I remember when I was a teenager, if I wanted to get somebody good, you're a faggot, right? That's the last thing you want to be called. In the Bible, you know what they say all the time? It, am I like a dog's head? Because, you know, it's not me to take the children. It's not, yeah, it's not me to take the children's, uh, 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 does he say meat again? Bread. Bread, he says. It's not me to take the children's bread and cast it unto dogs. Saying unto just like something worthless. And then we today, we take that animal and we let it into our house. See how this is all cultural. See the brainwashing? You understand what I'm saying? People that lived in Mesopotamia and the Middle East throughout those thousands of years would think that your house is disgusting from dogs being in there. You know what I'm saying? It's all cultural. They, they would be like, ugh, that's like the most dirtiest animal that exists. And, and dogs are very disgusting. Right. They really are. I mean, that's just a fact. If you watch their habits, you know what I'm talking about. And they're disgusting animals. But it's cultural. So even an animal that they thought's the most disgusting, people today are like, oh, it's because of brainwashing, man. People are brainwashed, aren't they? They just they manipulate your mind. That's how strong... Propaganda and Hollywood and all these things are. They make you think, you know, they make you feel even more so sometimes for an animal than you do for a human being. And that's why you have all these kids being activists for the rights of animals. But then they're fine with children being killed and aborted every day. We need to conform our mind, you know, we need to you know, transform our mind to the Bible's philosophies and not be conformed to the world. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, verse number 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward? And then it says this, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. Of course, you can make a spiritual application about someone going to hell, right? But the primary application here is man's spirit returns back to God, like the Bible says elsewhere. And then the, it says the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. Saying just disappears is what I believe that saying. Just dissipates. It's gone. Why? Because he dies, goes down to the earth, he's just done. He's gone. Because he has no value. God did not create his spirit or his soul to be conscious or exist for all eternity. But God created man to exist for all eternity. God desires man to live in heaven with him forever. Because God wants to have a relationship with man. He doesn't desire a relationship with an animal, and neither should you. We should, just, we should uplift the value of mankind and care about all those babies that are being aborted. Care about all the people that are mistreated and that are, you know, just, just treated poorly. All the bad things that happen to human beings today. And stop, you know, caring about stupid animals and beasts that are dumb, that don't have understanding. We need to have the same philosophy that the men of the Bible had, that Scripture gives us, and uplift mankind. We need to glorify God. I'm not saying praise mankind. I'm saying uplift it from where they put it down. The value of mankind is down here. We need to put it where God has it. As far as in, in relation to creation, it, we're up here, creation's down here. We have goals and purposes for our lives that God has set up for us where we can glorify him. We need to look at all of mankind. That that, the value of life is important. We're greater than sparrows. We're greater than sheep, sheep Jesus said. Jesus treated, you know, he doesn't care about oxen. He said it for man. He loves man. And we should love our fellow brethren as well and not, and not become consumed with animals. They're beasts. They're stupid animals. We need to love mankind. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you that, uh, that it's, it's a rock that's, that's never changing. Societies, cultures, philosophies, everything changes. But your word never changes. We can always go back to it. And we can always see what is truth, no, no matter how confusing things become. Just help us, dear Lord, to, to understand uh, the value of animals as opposed to the value of mankind, according to you, dear Lord. We love you and be with us. And uh, help us to, uh, to, to continually renew our mind. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.